I am the director of the African American History Initiative here at the Missouri Historical Society. Welcome to our program and thank you for joining us this evening. This evening's presentation featuring Vivian Gibson will discuss her latest book, The Last Children of Mill Creek. According to the Los Angeles Review of Books, The Last Children of Mill Creek is an elegy from the melancholy last of the title to the sepia-toned photo of a young girl on the cover and the author's preface, every element of the book's framing signals that this is a story about a vanished world. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our members, donors, and supporters of the Zoo Museum Tax District. Thank you so very much. Tonight's program will run for about 60 minutes, which includes a 20-minute presentation, a 15-minute panel discussion, and a 15-minute Q&A portion. For your convenience, you can submit questions through the Q&A button in your toolbar, and in order to streamline the process, we would prefer for you to wait until the end to ask your questions. Please know that we may not be able to get to all of the questions, but we will do our very best to answer as many as we can. At this time, I'm going to introduce our guest presenter and kick off tonight's program. Hello, Vivian. Hello. <laughs> hello, Vivian everybody. Hello. <laughs> Vivian Gibson was raised on Bernard Street in Mill Creek Valley, 454 acres in the heart of downtown St. Louis that comprised the nation's largest urban renewal project beginning in 1959. She started writing short stories about her childhood memories of the dying community after retiring at the age of 66. Vivian was a contributing playwright to 50 and 50, writing women into existence, performed at the Billie Holiday Theater in Brooklyn, New York. She is the author of a short story, Sun Up to Sundown, published in St. Louis Anthology in June 2019. An essay exerted from her memoir entitled, My Father's Accident appeared in Plow Quarterly Magazine on June 2020. For the first 18 years, there has been a permanent interactive exhibit on the Ross, the Ross family depicting her childhood home in the Reflections Gallery at the Missouri Historical Society. Vivian received an AFA degree in apparel design from the Fashion Institute of Technology in New York City and earned a bachelor's degree in business administration from Fontbonne bon University. Washington University St. Louis honored her as one of its most outstanding students in 2012 when she received her master's in nonprofit management at the age of 63. She currently lives less than a mile from what was the historic Mill Creek Valley community in downtown St. Louis that she writes about in her memoir. Since the April release of Gibson's book, we have watched her riveting memoir has drawn in readers both nationally and internationally. We are sad that COVID delayed the initial book launch on site, but we couldn't be more happier for Vivian and the success of her book, which is the topic of the discussion for this evening. So without further ado, I am going to turn the program over to our guest speaker for the evening, Ms. Vivian Gibson. Thank you, Shakia. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. Uh, initially from the Missouri Historical Society, they've been such a wonderful partner for me and my book, and uh, I'm so pleased that we're able to uh, do this tonight. So, as Shakia said, we're going to just look at a few pictures. One of the um, disappointments about the book, and I've heard it from a lot of the readers, is that there are no pictures. So tonight I'm going to go through through a few slides and show you some pictures. Uh, Shakia, could you just move it along? Yeah. So there I am, probably about the age uh, and younger uh, that I write about 
my observations, what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing, what I think I'm hearing. Uh, so you can imagine what's going on in children's minds. So all of you uh, adults out there, just remember the children are listening and watching. Next slide. This is a drawing. Uh, about two weeks ago, I said to my brother, we don't have a picture of our house. Uh, so uh, the next morning, he emailed this, me this drawing of the outside of our house. It looks a lot bigger <laughs> on, on this drawing than it really is. It was just three rooms on the first floor and three and a half rooms on the top floor. Uh, when you read my, my book, you'll see that it's approximately 800 square feet that we lived in. And at times there were 11 of us. Next slide. This is uh, a bunch of my sisters and brothers. I wasn't born yet. Uh, this is uh, some of the last children of Mill Creek. Uh, Angela Mitchell, who has become a friend of mine, she's an author that I went to when I realized that I was going to be writing the book. And uh, she was kind enough to write a uh, blurb for the back cover of my book. And I thought this was very poignant that she wrote, childhood is for most of us where our true home resides. And uh, when you're reading my book, I think maybe you might agree with her. Next slide. These are my parents. My mother, Frances Elizabeth Hamilton Ross. My father, Randall Henry Ross. He's holding my older brother. And that's my older sister, Laverne. Uh, that was, um, you know, when they were just starting to be parents. Um, my mother's beautiful, that lower right hand picture, it's probably what she looked like around the time that she uh, first came to St. Louis. Uh, the one up at the top is after a few uh, babies, so you can see she's got some of that baby fat on her. <laughs> the next picture, please. And that's my dad. He looks pretty handsome, doesn't he? Uh, I hope you can see that upper right picture. If not, if you can adjust the, the picture so that you can see, and he's on the far right. Uh, he was a, a singer, a beautiful baritone. He sang in a quartet, uh, and he was singing in that quartet when my mother met him in St. Louis. And the lower picture is of my father at about age 14, his mother and his stepfather, and that's the pic last picture they took before they left Arkansas to come to St. Louis so that my father could go to high school. There was no high school in Arkansas near where, for black students where he lived. And so they left Arkansas for him to go to Bashan High School. Next slide. And that's all of us. <clears throat> this picture was in the St. Louis Argus, somewhere around 1955 or six. Uh, we all joined the NAACP as a family, all of us. My mother was a volunteer at the NAACP office um, in the um, People's Finance Building at the intersection of Jefferson and Market. And we were all junior members of the NAACP. And so they took our picture to show that we uh, joined as a family, as a, a recruiting uh, a promotion. So there we all are. I don't know what we're reading. Next slide. So um, this is a, a pretty, common picture that's seen a lot. Uh, I think we, I'm pretty sure we got it from the Historical Society, Missouri Historical Society, but it gives you a, an idea of the density uh, of Mill Creek and you can see the Continental uh, insurance building in the far background. You can see the steeple of the college church at Washington University. So this looks like it's somewhere around Clark, maybe, and uh, maybe 
Compton or, or something like that, maybe even Jefferson. But all of the houses were pretty close together. They had wooden steps to, that went out into the backyard. Many of them still have outhouses in the backyard and, and all kinds of sheds. We have one that we call the coal shed, but it was a densely populated community. Uh, on this slide, it talks about the boundaries, but I'm going to show you a map too for some of you who are not quite sure um, where Mill Creek was. Next slide. Uh, th this parade is an interesting picture. It could be the, uh, I don't know what parade it could, it could be the Veil Prophet Parade, but I think it's interesting because you can see this is Market Street and Union Station is right in the background. The Federal Court Building is uh, in the middle there. There is a movie theater called The Strand or was uh, a movie theater there. So all of that, right, just where this picture is taken is where the new soccer stadium is going to be. And uh, so it's interesting. I wonder if, if all those people coming down to the soccer stadium ever thought that that was a whole nother community of 20,000 people. Um, the bridge at the top right is a bridge that doesn't exist anymore. It was, it was the Ewing Bridge. There was a bridge from Scott Avenue across the railroad tracks to uh, Pepin Street and Shoto. And a lot of students who lived on the south side walked across this bridge to uh, go to Vashon High School. And this is another kind of vintage picture. Um, I think again, Market Street looking east. Okay, another slide. This is a, a, an interesting map uh, that showed the existing Mill Creek just before they, they tore it down. Um, at the top of the map is uh, Grand Avenue. So everything on the east side of Grand at, that was St. Louis University was on the west and Mill Creek was on the east side. So now all of those those buildings and stadiums and parking lots that were that are on the east side of Grand that belonged to St. Louis University was all Mill Creek. These are all people who lived here. Um, the um, north side is Lindell that turns into Olive and comes all the way down to about 20th Street. Beyond 20th Street is, of course, Union Station. Uh, this, this kind of, this street in the middle is Market Street. It was the heart of Mill Creek. Jefferson is uh, another very big intersection is where uh, a lot of businesses and stores, the, the uh, People's Finance Building was there. But all of these are homes of 20,000 Black people. Here's Vashon High School. Um, Lots of churches. I don't know if yours is in color. I assume it is, but all of the green buildings are schools. We had Lincoln Elementary School, which is which was our school. There was Johnson School, Vashon. There's Waring School. So all of those, and then there's the bridge that comes across uh, Jefferson to Shoto, and uh, there was a school there at the end of that bridge. You had to double back and go under the bridge to go to Attuck School. And uh, so that's Mill Creek. That was Mill Creek. Next slide. Mill Creek had 40 churches, and um, they were all torn down. This is St. Malachi, which was on Oh, about Leffingwell and, and Clark, I think. Um, and this is at the bottom right, St. Malachi, as they're starting to demolish it. There were 40 churches and uh, there was a commission at uh, Washington University School of Architecture where uh, they decided, that commission decided which one of the 40 churches would remain. And um, next slide, 
I think we'll show you the one church that did remain. No, that's not it yet, but this is fine. This happened to be our church. This is Northern Baptist Church. It was on uh, Ewing near Scott, um, just a few blocks from, <clears throat> excuse me, the train tracks. And this is our entire congregation. I think it's around 1942 because my father is in the picture here with his army uniform and his army cap. And my father was only in the uh, army for six months because he had too many dependents. So they sent him back home. So that's how we know uh, that this picture was about 1942. Uh, this is my grandmother right next to the pastor, Pastor Felix Shepherd. My oldest sister is, is in this picture. So this is a church that I write about a lot in the book. Uh, my father was um, the janitor of the church and he was the um, choir director, and the musical director at the church. Uh, so we spent a lot of time there uh, in those days. We had to go to church with my father in the morning to on Sunday mornings to open the church and dust the pews and vacuum and get ready for church and then go to Sunday school and go to regular service and then take our lunch. We took our lunch to church. We were at church so long that we actually brought our lunch to church. Then there was an afternoon service and, and uh, an evening service. And in those days, uh, people's funerals were on Sunday nights. I don't care when you died, your funeral would be on Sunday night. So on days when there were funerals, we could be at church from eight in the morning to almost 10 o'clock at night. Uh, but that was part of our life. So we had what I called Sunday friends. So all these children here were part of my enjoyment of, of Sundays because we, we were in choirs and ushers and we just had a good time. My uh, sibling, older siblings didn't have as much fun as me though. Next slide. So this is the one church that remains uh, in Mill Creek. Some of you probably drive past it all the time and don't even recognize it because this is actually the rear of what was Berea Presbyterian Church. It is the front of the church, a beautiful front of the church is actually backs up to a dormitory at Harris Stowe State University. And there's a, <laughs> there is a, the day I went there to take this picture, there was a dumpster in front of it and a fence around it. And, um, the street was pine. It used to be on Pine Street, but pine doesn't come down that far anymore. So this is the back of the church. There's a parking lot in front of it. If, <clears throat> if any of you have had an opportunity to go to Pappy's Barbecue, it is directly east of that. Um, and it's a beautiful church. It now belongs to St. Louis University and they didn't use the original name so many people are not even aware that that is the only remaining church from mill creek it was built in 1896 uh, as a black congregation and uh, it's kind of sad next slide uh, i also write a lot in the book about my mother my mother was an artist and a craftsperson and um these are a few of the remaining um, doilies and, and tablecloths and quilts uh, that my mother made to sell to uh, supplement our family in income. She was also a mill nurse. She made women's hats. Um, and um, so, I mean, I, I'm really sad that we don't have a lot of the things that she made because we really we were so accustomed to seeing them that we, we didn't keep a lot of them, I'm sad to say. Next slide. These two guys are my <clears throat> brothers, Shep and Randall. I write a lot about them. I didn't realize until it was over how much I wrote, a, wrote about them, but they were an important part of my 
my life. And uh, I think you're going to enjoy uh, reading some of the accounts of, of uh, what they did. They did everything together. My mother had this system. There were eight children and the four older children were <clears throat> assigned uh, a younger one. My, I was assigned to uh, my sister Jean. Randall, of course, had my brother Honey here. And, and that simply meant that they were responsible for making sure we got up, got our breakfast, got dressed, got to school, got home from school, um, that sort of thing. And, and we were little teens. And these guys were uh, a great team. And I think you'll enjoy a lot of the stories. Next slide. That's me. Um, that's me at about 11 when I finally learned how to comb my own hair because my mother didn't know how to comb my hair. Uh, that's me and my brother Honey at the top there. He was a sweet guy, which, which is probably why he was called Honey. And that's me probably around six, seven months old. Next slide. This is the last picture uh, that we took together as a family. My brother Randall here is in the, was, was in the Marines. He came home and so we took a, a family picture. Um, we, didn't, we didn't have a lot of these really nice pictures, but uh, this is one that I'm glad we had a chance to take. So here we all are, they're teenagers. My sister Laverne is, is out of school and he's in the Marines. And so the, the family is starting to uh, shrink a little bit. Next slide. And this is my wedding picture. And uh, you can see how much I adore my new husband. But this is my dad. I put this picture here because <clears throat> it's the last picture uh, I have of my father before he passed away. He came to my wedding and five months later, he had a heart attack and passed away. So I just uh, want to show this picture. Uh, I think a lot of you will get to know him in the book. And I think that's the last slide, Shakia. Yeah. So now I'd like to bring on our panelists. They've been um, patiently waiting. Can they hear me to come on? Stephanie, yay! And Donna. I want to introduce you to my friends Stephanie Russell and Donna Rogers Beard. Um, Donna is a retired history teacher. Uh, she taught for, uh, I think she said 51 years mm -hmm. at uh, both the uh, University City and the Clayton School Districts. And um, I'm re she's a, a native of Chicago, so she knows a little bit about urban life. So maybe we'll talk about that. Uh, Stephanie, we call her Steph. Uh, Stephanie Russell is a writer, uh, a historian. She's part of um, the informal history zine, zine and podcast collective. I just learned what zine is. It's, it's like the hip way of saying magazine. <laughs> <laughs> and I chose, uh, I invited Donna and Stephanie to talk with me this evening because they wrote such nice things about me very early on in this whole process of me writing this book. Uh, the, first, um, the first book I was uh, part of was the St. Louis Anthology. And Steph wrote me a, a very nice note uh, after um, I read part of one of my stories and said that she enjoyed it and that she was looking forward to the book. And then later on, um, once I produced this book, um, she wrote me another note and said something that really stuck in my head. She said that, um, that my book was, I have it right here, um, Ah, there it is. She said, my book was deeply a deeply important counter-narrative 
to the stories that had been told by, about Mill Creek. And I thought that was a very interesting phrase, a counter narrative. I wish I had said it. And I have used it a couple of times in quotes, but I'll give you credit for that now. But I really, that really did make me think, and I hope maybe we're going to talk about that a little more tonight. And Donna, wrote me uh, a couple of notes as well. Uh, and in one of them, she said that, she, well, first she thanked me for, for writing the book. And then she said that I trusted my reader. And I'm not sure what she meant by that. Again, I hope we'll talk about that a little bit and she'll tell us. But to me, uh, it resonated because I did have to trust my reader because I wrote this book from the perspective of a young child and I intentionally wanted to write about what that child saw and, and what, what life was like for that child. So I didn't want to filter it through my adult experiences. So I wanted my reader, I trusted my reader to know what society was like at that time, that it wasn't a Pollyannish um, view of a child, that there was some serious things going on. There was some real apartheid going on in that community. And so I wrote it trusting that people knew that there was something sinister going on while this child was having this idyllic life that uh, I sometimes describe. So ladies, let's chat. Um, I'm hoping that uh, you have um, some questions or some thoughts or some ideas. So uh, you want to start, Steph? Yeah, so I, I can jump off on the counter narrative thing, because um, I had a question for you about that. It was a little later down on my list, but I think we can start with that. So I just want to really briefly preface this by saying I'm not from St. Louis. And I, when I worked at St. Louis Magazine, I kind of became the history writer person. <laughs> and I came across the story of Mill Creek almost by accident. And I really had to dig and dig and dig to get information. And when it became clear to me the mm -hmm. scale of the displacement of these black families. I mean, it was appalling. And I think the thing that was the most appalling to me of all was number one, that there was so little discourse in the collective mm -hmm. about it. I mean, it felt like it had just been swept under the rug. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I found really unsettling was just when I dug a lot of what I found was in the newspaper archives. And I think you touch on this in the book, a lot of those newspaper articles almost had the ring of propaganda to me. And mm -hmm. that honestly was what got me digging even more furiously because I was like, this is not like just gut level. This, what they're saying here just doesn't ring true. And so I wanted to ask you about your own process of research for the book, because obviously I know you talked to your family and friends and you had your own. Yeah little archive of photos, but was it difficult for you to find information and how did you research? Yeah, no, it wasn't difficult. Uh, a lot of my research was done at um, um, the archives at the Missouri Historical Society on um, um, Skinker, uh, looking at a lot of newspapers, newspaper.com, um, reading a lot of white accounts because uh, newspaper.com doesn't have a lot of black newspapers to read what was being said. I had to um, go to the History Museum to read through some of, some of the black accounts of, of what was going on. So it was jarring for me too to see black people called invaders and and the neighborhood was always called a slum. And, and I agree that it sounded like propaganda to me because they really, uh, the powers that be, really needed to persuade uh, voters who had to vote a bond issue for this, that this community deserved to disappear, mm -hmm. to vanish. And so it was, it was hurtful oftentimes to read 
um, what I had to read about my life. These people were talking about me and, and very casually talking about how, uh, how we lived and how we were. Uh, and it was very, it was sad, but I think it was what they felt had to be done to make sure that progress uh, occurred. And we were in probably one of the most desirable parts of the city, um, Market Street, straight down the heart of the city, next to the train station where all visitors came in to the city. And um, they wanted that land back. They wanted uh, what they considered a nuisance uh, to be out of the way for anybody coming to the city. And um, there's a book um, that I'm sure you, you are familiar with, The Broken Heart of America. Chapter nine is all about St. Louis. And the title of that chapter is Black Removal by White Approval. And that's basically the story. White people wanted that land back and we were in the way. But the problem was, where were we going to go? Because that was a segregated part of, uh, of our community and uh, we were not allowed to live in other areas. So the problem was, we want this land, but what are we going to do with these 20,000 Black people? And so that became part of the issue. Did I answer your question? That was awesome, yeah. Okay. <laughs> So Donna, let's get you in. Um, Donna uh, was a, a history teacher at Clayton High School when my daughter attended Clayton High School. And I said, was, was uh, Donna your teacher? She says, no, but I loved her. <laughs> so Donna, talk to me about uh, your impressions of the book. Yeah, I, you know, I, first of all, I want to thank you. I've read many, many memoirs. But I don't think I've read one that had the details and the honesty that you brought to your book. For 140 pages, I felt like Plum <laughs> at the end of the book, who's, who says that from her window, she peered into your house and looked at your family. And so I just felt like I was Plum by the end <laughs> of that book. And it was just wonderful. And so one, when I talked about trust, not only the trust with a very, very honest look at Mill Creek, because as an outsider, as a Chicago person, when I was first introduced to Mill Creek, because Mill Creek was gone by the time I got here, most people just talked about the, the incredible almost Black Wall Street and did not get into really the details of what it was like day to day, the merchants, the, the personalities that you bring out. I think the, the character in your book who resonated so much with me was your dad mm -hmm. and the honesty in which you approach your dad. I can see him standing in that window at the hospital <laughs> waving to the children. Uh, this is your, when your dad has had his accident. He's in the hospital and only your children had to stand outside and then he would wave to you and, and you'd wave back to him. And his caring, the fact that he thought about gathering up all those things that they give you at the hospital, like the soap and the lotion. And of course, that was so funny about the sugar packets. <laughs> Don't go any further. <laughs> um, and so he was, he was such an important person in this book, especially as so much criticism of the sociologists and others has been about the absence of the Black father. And you have this person who is such an incredible dynamic person within his family. And you're very honest, too, in some of the, the issues of discipline. Yes. And so when you describe that whooping that happens on a Friday, was it a Friday night? Sometimes was, Friday, sometimes Saturday. <laughs> it seemed almost like a weekly thing. <laughs> and uh, it, it was somewhat humorous in the way that the variety of the various children reacted 
Mm -hmm. I loved it because I kind of kind of resonated with me too. <laughs> all been through that, and then uh, there was the night when the teenager Jean stayed out past curfew, and that's a horrendous, horrifying episode in your book. And I think the trust that I saw is that your reader would read this, understand it, um, relate to it, and at the end feel the same love for your dad, respect for your dad, that your family did. So I just thought, oh my goodness, what an incredible, incredible depiction of, of the father in the family. Yeah. Um, so I wondered as you and your, and you said you and your siblings never discussed that again, yeah. but I wondered in the writing of this book, yes. and uh, as you sat down and kind of sorted out your memories. Did it come out? And um, did you have different memories of things that happened in the family? Yeah. It's interesting, even now, we did not discuss that. I have not discussed that with, with Jean. Uh, it was, I don't know, you know, and, and, and she, she gets a pretty bad uh, uh, whipping. Uh, because she stayed out, and and my and I've wondered about that because it it was much worse than it than anything we'd ever had before. I, it was it was, um, and that that scene in the book is one that's discussed a lot in my interviews, and it almost comes down uh, racial lines. It's almost like you said, uh, you can re relate to some of that, and Black people say, yeah, yeah, it happened, and we did it, and we got it, and there's, there have been more than one white person said, oh my God, it was so abusive, and, and I, I've been asked about that several times. Uh, no, we didn't talk about it, but in terms of, uh, I did talk to my siblings a lot about some things because, and their, their um, memory of, of some incidents that we shared were different. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't talk to Jean about it, but I talked to my other sister, Tootie, who was with me when uh, we were looking for her. My sister got a, uh, um, a beating and she hid afterwards. And when we woke up the next morning, we couldn't find her. And so we spent the day looking for her and uh, uh, my another sister, Tootie, and I actually found her and were prepared to uh, let her stay there forever. We were going to bring her food and water and that sort of thing. So I did talk, talk to Tootie about it, but Jean, my sister Jean that it happened to is now uh, in her 45th year of MS, mm -hmm. and uh, she struggles um, uh, physically, although her mind is still very good. Uh, if you talk to her on the phone, you don't really realize it. Uh, but when you see her, you see that her body's ravished. But uh, she didn't, she never mentioned it. She didn't say a word about it. But I did talk to them about a lot of things. I bounced things off my siblings. It was part of my research. I would sometimes talk around it. I didn't ask for like, tell me this story or tell me this. And sometimes I would say, do you, one incident is with my sister Tootie again. I write in the book about a tenant we had, a, a rumor. Yeah. And uh, I asked my sister one day, I said, do you remember little bit she said, you mean Miss Little Bit? Because all children called everybody Mr. and Mrs. and Miss. I said, yeah. I said, did she live in our, did she live in our basement? She said, no, she lived in the coal shed. And my sister is five years younger than, older than me. And that was one of the things that I noticed that the older siblings had a different perspective on thing, a different way of viewing it. And I think it had to do with their level of maturity or my immaturity. Um, so my memory was always of this person being in the backyard, but I never thought that she lived in our coal shed. So she was in essence a homeless person that my mother allowed to uh, take shelter 
in our uh, coal shed and later on was able to allow her to live in our basement. So it was always nice to bounce things off, off of my siblings. Um, I would ask sometimes just for clarification and I would get a story. And um, when I'd write it, my bro I wrote one story about my brother selling papers and I described where he went to get these papers to sell them. And when I read the story to him, he said, did you ever go there? I went, I don't think so, which was kind of a strange thing because he said, I described the interior of that building or that warehouse so vividly that he thinks maybe he must have taken me there, but I didn't remember it that way. So um, there was a lot of bouncing off of them and a lot of research uh, in newspapers and archives and pictures tr triggered memories and that sort of thing. So you had, uh, Donna, a kind of a, uh, a personal relationship that you discovered in the book. I certainly did. Uh, my sister-in-law. Yeah, uh, Virginia Beard, and I, I knew some stories about her growing up in Mill Creek, but when you describe her mother coming into church and how well-respected <laughs> the woman was, and for the first time I saw that yeah. family, that yeah. family I really did not know that well, and of course her father's connection to Archie Moore and uh, that was such a gift. And that whole idea of mentorship. Yeah. Oh, and to know, because Virginia was, she was always taking people under her wing. And yes. to know that it started so early in yeah, life. Yeah, it started as a teenager. Oh, that was so beautiful, which is another reason why I would just love to see this book somehow in the schools. Yeah. Because that is, we talk about it. But you experience it from another St. Louis and someone I knew and loved. And uh, you, you described so well how it looked. Yeah. And, and I loved it. It's a great, great story. Yeah. I, that, you know, that's part of what made me want to write this book is that sense of community mm -hmm. in... Uh, that we had that people don't know. People talk about slums and ghettos and poverty and, and that sort of thing. But they, I wanted to write about a community, about a family, how we did live within the confines of, of uh, almost what I, I mean, what I decided was hatred. I just didn't understand that it was going on. And I have to just give so much credit to the adults in that community for protecting children. I had no sense that I was despised <laughs> by, by the larger community. I mean, as a child, my world was small. Um, I didn't know, we couldn't go, but so far, but I didn't know that we couldn't go that way, that far because we couldn't be in a white community. I had no idea. And uh, I have to give so much credit to my parents and to, to uh, all the adults who were struggling and striving. My grandmother worked literally from sun up to sundown and uh, cleaning houses and taking care of white children. And we didn't know that, we didn't even, we didn't have a television for a long, long time. So we didn't know anything outside of that world. And, and uh, we were protected from a lot. And I appreciate that so much. Blessing. Mm -hmm. So Steph, you got another question? Yeah, I have a writer question. Ah. And I just wanted to, um, to like some of what Donna was saying, like play off of that a little bit. I just have to say that when I started to read this book, it was like the whole world evaporated. Like I had to, I, I didn't want to put the book down, but I knew by the time I got to the end of it, like maybe 10 pages toward the end that I would feel really sad that I would be leaving this world because and I think that's the mark of great writers is they are really good at world building. It was just so, and the cat I wanted to mention too, <laughs> this cat, 
has the tiniest cameo. He comes walking across maybe one or two pages, but that cat, like even that little tiny detail, that cat scared me. <laughs> I mean, it was just like a couple of brush strokes and, and even this tiny little character, this kitty, like, yeah. Anyway, it, so I love the book. And so I have to ask a writer's question. Um, and I'm really curious. I mean, you had this career in fashion mm -hmm. and you worked in the culinary arts and, and intuitively I feel like the precision and the creativity required in those disciplines, like I see that in your work and I'm wondering how those things inform you as a writer. Yeah. Well, I think informing me as a writer is a good way of putting it because I write what I see and I see pictures in, in my mind and I, I describe them. Now, I didn't know that I was a writer. And I'm still saying, oh, I'm, I'm not really a writer. Um, so I didn't know. So it wasn't as if I studied writing and, 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 I, and I, I, I didn't. I, I see myself as a storyteller. And uh, I talk in stories. You can ask my children. Uh, everything is, is a lesson and a story. Um, but I don't. I can't even explain it to you because I was simply recording memories and I wrote these stories over a long time. I mean, over 20, 30, maybe 40 years. I started writing the stories uh, when my mother passed away and I realized how little I knew about her, about her life, how many things we didn't get a chance to discuss. I was 27 years old, so I was just becoming a woman. Uh, and I, I lost my mother at a time when I would have started asking the right questions. And it was too late. Uh, so I didn't want to do that with, have that same experience with my children. So I started writing these these memories down. <clears throat> and I just, I think I have a pretty vivid imagination. I, I cook, uh, I, and I'm one of those scratch cook, cooks, although I went to culinary school. Um, but cooking came easy, easily to me. Um, I remember home ep economics. That was one of my best classes. I could sew already and I could cook already. And I really did enjoy it. But there is something, a kind of uh, intuitive nature to, to the things I do. And I think it has to do with how we were raised. We had to do all of these things with so little. We made our own toys. Uh, we made our own fun. We told stories. We sang. We worked and we worked and we worked. But we, the, the work was about making things, creating things. Um, so I think a, a lot of my writing and my creativity is just from figuring things out, having to figure things out and the details and how things work and how things are put together and how things complement each other. And I, that's all I can say to you. I think if you ask any creative person how they do something, they're hard pressed to say how because uh, it's not something that's easily taught. And that's kind of where the magic comes from. In a that's way. where the magic comes <laughs> from. Yeah. So I remember I started right, compiling all of these stories after I retired and I started a creative writing course just to get some help uh, with pulling them together. And it took me a while to be persuaded by the p other people in the cl class and the facilitator that I am, in fact, a writer. I went there thinking, okay, um, somebody's going to show me how to do this. And they're saying, oh, this is good. And I'm going, okay, but how do I do this part? And you know, that sort of thing, which is what writing workshops are all about is getting this feedback and, and helping you to develop your writing. And I fell in love with writing workshop. I mean, I, I would 
write for the workshop, I'd get the critique, I'd come home and I'd, I'd rewrite and I'd wake up at five o'clock in the morning because that's my time to write, um, which is part of my creative nature too, is I can't have anything going on. There are people who say they listen to music while, while they write. I have to have dark and quiet. So I write four, five, six o'clock in the morning. By the time the, the sun comes up, I'm done. I might do some rewriting or some editing, but the actual creative writing is like being in a darkened theater and I have these movies going on in my mind. And I just describe what I see. Does that help? That's wonderful. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, um, I don't know how much time we have. Uh, Sh Shakia, um, I don't have a clock here in front of me. Is it time for us to maybe take some questions? Yes, ma'am. And the questions are rolling in. <laughs> okay. We have questions in the Q&A bar, and we also have questions in the chat. So I want to make sure that we honor those that kind of came up a little bit earlier during the presentation. And I'll keep my answer shorter. Okay. <laughs> no, it's fine. This, the readers, our viewers want to hear this from you. And I'm really appreciative of you sharing your knowledge and kind of the teasers for the book. So this is great. Okay. It looks like we have a question from Patricia. I'm really enjoying this discussion. Donna Rogers Beard, how does your childhood experience in an urban uh, Chicago compare to a Mill Creek childhood experience? Good question. Yeah, our community was different from Mill Creek, uh, although I had the same experience that you did going off to college to find out that I lived in the second largest ghetto in America. <laughs> uh, I said, ghetto? <laughs> what are you talking about? So, yeah, having outsiders describe what I knew as this incredible community and uh, just rich environment and knowing my parents, like, that's something, having that strong father, that grandmother who was the anchor from the, in the Great Migration, having rumors and learning so much from those wonderful women who came into our lives and left. Um, I, I, it very much resonates with, with me. Sounds great. Okay, and the second part to that question is, how did you know Vivian trusted her audience? Wow. I, oh, yeah, it, it, to put the details uh, that she did and to accept and and you knew this was not going to be about judgment, that, that this was going to be about understanding and sharing and feeling validated and all of that good stuff you do with a good friend. And I, and I felt that's what she was doing in the book, reaching out to people she did not know as a friend and mentor, and it was just, yeah, I, I, I felt, even though I, I've met you briefly, I thought, okay, this is a trusting, wonderful person. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay, we have another question from Richard. He said, gorgeous memoir, Vivian. You are not a writer by profession. How did you find the encouragement inspiration, resources to produce this work. How did you work with your editors? That, now that was a tremendous learning experience. So I didn't set out to write a book. So I didn't even think about how to work with someone, how to work with a publisher, how to work with an editor. Um, I had some experience in the workshop of sharing and being critiqued, so that helped a little bit to take the edge off of an editor. But then, of course, I heard horror stories. Um, when I decided that I was going to write this book, I started seeking advice from other writers and they were telling me all these horrible stories about how they didn't even recognize their book when they got it back. Well, that was not my experience. Uh, Martha Bain was my editor at Belt Publishing and Martha is so chill. I tell you, I, I was nervous. She's so chill that she, 
I worried. I'm thinking she's not saying anything that, you know, that I was waiting to hear. So when I would send my manuscript in and, or send in edits and was waiting to hear back from her, I was a nervous wreck because I, especially the first time when I got uh, her corrections or her suggestions back, I was so nervous. Um, but it worked, it worked well. I don't know it was, if it was because <clears throat> I had that workshop experience, but nothing was ever as horrible as I imagined it to be. And so I think a good editor can help you uh, write better, uh, but not change. And, and so Martha was just very, very cool and chill in her suggestions, and they were almost kind the way she said things. But I had to make changes, but it was a very rewarding process. And when it was all said and done, I felt like my writing was better, was clearer and not changed. So that was a good experience. Thank you, Vivian. Okay, this question comes from Rebecca. She says, I will read. Are there other narratives about the community moving? Uh, I, there are not a lot. I read one book after I finished. And it's by, I think, Malika Horn, and it's called Mother Wit. And it turns out that uh, the book is about her mother, but they lived in Mill Creek. And so a lot of it is about the community. And uh, it turns out that since it was such a small, com compact community, that a lot of what we saw and described was the same thing. They ended, it, I think maybe they only lived about three blocks from us. But when you're a child, your block is your world. <laughs> and if, you're, if you go to a different elementary school, you don't even know those people. So that, that I enjoyed that book, even though it was more about uh, her fabulous mother who really uh, pushed her children to, to go to college. And I think every one of them ended up going to college. Uh, um, that was the only book I read. I read one other that had a little, a little portion of it um, about uh, Mill Creek, but in this book, her family moved out uh, very early. Uh, and so there wasn't a lot. And so I did a lot of it, like I said, there was a lot of research that was just in newspapers uh, to verify some of my memories. And that's, that was what the research was about. I was writing about my memories, but I wanted to be sure that the people I talked about and the locations I talked about were, in fact, where I thought they were, that, that sort of thing, just verifying that information. Uh, the H Historical Society has these huge, wonderful insurance maps. They're huge. I mean, like five feet by four feet. They take up an entire table. And the maps were, were produced by insurance companies uh, so that police and firemen could find buildings that might be on fire. And, but every one of the houses and the inhabitants of those houses were on those maps. And so when I would think about, well, Mr. So-and-so lived kind of up the street, and I remember it was around the corner, and when I would look at that map, and there he was, it was like finding gold. It was just wonderful. So the research was a lot of fun for me. Okay, we have two more questions and okay. one more comment. I'm hoping that we could get through those. Patricia asked, for those of us who are still blessed to have our mothers, what questions should we ask her? Whoa, Patricia. That's interesting. Um, my mother never talked about her mother. Mm. So I wonder why, I still wonder why. Her mother died when she was in college. Um, and her father lived to quite a long time after that, and her father was a very 
domineering person in, in, in that family, but her, my mother loved him. They called, my mother and her sister called her father Papa. And they said it just like that, Papa. And it was just how they felt about him. But she never talked about her mother. So I think I would ask, what should I know about you? And that gives an opening for her to share what she wants to share, how she wants to share it. Um, I think a lot of, my father didn't talk a lot about his, neither of them talked a lot about their childhood. My father, I understand his child, childhood was very, very hard. And when they left Arkansas, they didn't want any part of that. They were starting over, starting a new life. Although, that life really did influence how he raised us. I say in the book that my father picked up Earl, Arkansas and plopped it right down in the middle of St. Louis because we lived like rural Southerners in the middle of downtown St. Louis. So I think just ask, just talk and ask, what do you want to tell me about your life? Because I didn't ask those questions. Mm. Thank you, Vivian. And our last question comes from Linda. Uh, Vivian, are you working on a new creative project? Well, sorta. <laughs> <laughs> right now, my creativity is trying to get this book promoted from my kitchen counter. But my, this book ends when I'm 27. So I have a lot of life after 27. And I was living in New York in the 70s with disco and all that kind of stuff going on. And um, <laughs> it was an exciting life for a, a rather naive uh, black girl in, in New York City. So I have a lot of interesting stories. So I'm compiling some of, some of those. I married, I moved, I lived uh, a while in Liberia, West Africa where there was a coup and I had to escape a coup with a baby. And so there are those, there are those stories that I, I'm thinking about, but that's uh, a little ways off. Oh, we can't wait for that book. <laughs> um, there's one more comment that I wanted to make sure that I got to before we close out. Uh, Stephanie's comments made me think of District 6 in Cape Town and how it was raised by white people. Mm -hmm. It would be interesting to compare the two histories. So that's yeah. just food for thought before we close out. And give me one second. All right. Well, I certainly do uh, want to thank you, uh, Shakia and Donna and Steph. This has been a wonderful experience. Right. I'm so grateful lovely. to the uh, History Museum for, for doing this for me and hanging in there with me six months later to, to have my launch that couldn't happen because of COVID. We did it, but I actually, I love the format tonight and I think it was extremely intimate and we got to hear a different side outside of just a regular author's talk. So Vivian, yeah. once again, thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Rogers Beard and Ms. Russell for sharing your time and expertise with us this evening. Um, if you are interested in supporting MHS through a membership, would, we would be so grateful. Um, please copy the link and paste it in your browser. Uh, your feedback is always important to us. We would really appreciate it if you could take a short survey. A Kobo toolbox survey should have opened in your browser, so please keep an eye out for that and be sure to take that survey. Each week, we host about two to three STL live history programs, and we would encourage you all to visit us on mohistory.org or keep an eye on our Facebook page and check us out. Look for current listings and current programs that we have. I've listed a few here on the screen, but please feel free to go to our website and find out more information. As always, thank you virtual visitors for hanging in there with us and participating in tonight's program. There are other comments. Vivian, before you click off, I 
hope you can just take a quick look into the comments. Um, people are praising you. They really enjoyed um, the content and they are looking forward to reading your book. So once again, everyone, thank you. Have a wonderful evening and we will see you soon. Wow, thank you. Thank you. Ladies. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.